Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Ryan Backman. I'm the founder and executive director of Project Cold Case. Uh, for uh, those joining us tonight, I uh, wanted to kind of share a little bit about what we do and uh, why we do it. So we sometimes get confused for a lot of things uh, with the name like Project Cold Case. Uh, people jump to a lot of conclusions and assumptions about what we do um, and why we do it. And uh, so I was hoping tonight to, to engage with you a little bit. Hey, Renee, good to see you. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, engage with some people, get some feedback, uh, answer some questions. And, and most importantly, you know, explain why it is uh, we do what we do um, and, and, and how we serve families. Because ultimately, that's our goal is to serve families that have been impacted by an unsolved homicide. Um, so... You know, a lot of times we kind of get lumped in with uh, with true crime podcasts or with um, private investigators, and and that's not uh, not our role. That's not what we do. Um, you know, honestly, we we steer clear of, of a lot of those things for um, for a number of different reasons. So uh, so hopefully, you know, if you have some questions about that tonight. Um, I can answer them for you and let you know why it is we do what we do. So, so first of all, um, Project Cold Case was started because uh, I recognized a need for an organization that uh, focused specifically on uh, unsolved homicides. Uh, I, I recognized that, that need because my own uh, father had been murdered and his case went cold. Um, relatively quickly and uh, I felt very alone and wanted to know um, what I could, you know, um, if I was the only one out there that was uh, experiencing this stuff. Um, obviously, uh, I wasn't. Uh, and I, when I started doing that research, I realized real quick that not only was I not the the only one, but, uh, but I, there was a whole lot of other families that were suffering uh, like mine was. And so um, I wanted to do something to assist those families and give them um, uh, an opportunity and a, and a place to feel safe and secure and express themselves um, and, and, and be open about uh, their trauma and their grief and the struggles of um of having a loved one that was um, taken by another human being and who uh, had not been held accountable. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of times um, people ask us about investigating their loved one's cases or reopening um, their loved one's cold case. And as much as I wish that's what we could do, um, that, that isn't what we can do. We, we don't have any jurisdictional, um, authority uh, where any of our your loved ones were killed or my own dad's uh, murder. So we can't, um, you know, go in and take a, a case from someone. Um, a family actually is the best way to ask that a case be looked at again. And we always recommend that our families um, keep in regular contact with, with law enforcement uh, and make those requests, um, you know, regularly but when i say regularly like you can't call every other month and ask that your your loved one's case be um be reopened but what you can do is you can kind of keep your finger on the pulse of technology and what's going on in in the world of investigations and cold case investigations and make sure that your loved one's case is is being brought up to the current investigative standards uh, of today so you know kind of what that means is if, if your loved one was killed in, in 1980, um, they weren't testing DNA. They weren't even collecting DNA evidence at that time. So um, they may have accidentally collected it. Uh, that happens a lot. You know, that there was uh, blood evidence that was collected at the scene, but not specifically for uh, DNA testing. So you need to call back and find out if, uh, if there was physical evidence at the scene, if any of that evidence um, could be tested for DNA if it has been tested for DNA. Um, and then what you need to do is kind of note, okay, as of, uh, hey, Melissa, my cousin chiming in, uh, Jessica, Betty, thank you guys for all, all watching tonight. Um, but what you, what you want to be able to do is kind of make note that, uh, okay, on, uh, on May 12th, 2020, when I called about my loved one's case, it, it had been tested. Uh, you know, all the evidence had been tested. The case had been looked at. 
on, you know, January 25th, um, you know, 2018. So that's a relatively close time when we're talking about investigations. There may not be anything that can be done um, at that time. But then as new evidence and, and new technology comes forward, new, new ways of testing evidence, um, you want to stay on top of that. Uh, genetic genealogy is a new tool out there. Uh, highly recommend that you call the, the law enforcement agency on your, your loved one's case and ask them if if there's evidence that is suitable for genetic genealogy testing. And, and when I, when I use these terms suitable, you know, um, stuff like that, like that's important because uh, if you just call up and you just say, I demand that, you know, my loved one's case uh, be submitted for genetic genealogy, um, you're making some assumptions there. And, uh, and you're assuming that there's physical evidence. You're assuming that there's DNA evidence. Um, you're assuming that it hasn't been done, and and you're also assuming there's there's some um, some kind of fine points about uh, about genetic genealogy. One is it's a different type of of DNA testing, so it's not the same type that that law enforcement is using to run in the FBI database or the statewide database uh, or anything like that. Your local database, like that, is a different type of DNA um, testing, and and uh, so. So when you're talking about genealogy, that evidence has to be sent back to another lab to be extracted in a new way for genealogy. OK, so this this it's not just sitting there in the evidence room waiting to be, you know, be sent off for genetic genealogy testing. There is a specific uh, type of extraction of that DNA uh, in order to do that. Um, second. You talk to genealogists and, and they will tell you that you do not want to use up every bit of DNA that, that you have in a case um, to try genealogy. You know, it, it really needs to be enough DNA because this technology is rapidly changing. And what isn't enough today or what might use it all up today could very well be plenty in a few years. So you have to be careful. And, and these are the things that law enforcement has to to consider. So, um, you know, uh, when they're determining whether your loved one's case is an acceptable fit for for that you know, for genetic genealogy as an investigative lead, what they're going to do is they're going to say, you know, OK, we have X amount of DNA. If we um, send a much smaller amount off to the lab to get the extraction for genetic genealogy testing, if we don't get anything back, we still have this volume uh, of DNA um, in case that, you know, for when technology improves and, uh, uh, and when they need less to, uh, to perform those kinds of tests. So keep that stuff in mind. It's always good to have that uh, dialogue, but also to be uh, knowledgeable about the subject. So when you call and you are talking to that, to the detective, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that you can share with them. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that you can ask so that they know that you understand the process and that you are, um, you know, uh, doing uh, your bit of research and trying to do your part to be understanding of their world, because that goes a long way as well. If you show um, that interest that you, that you have taken um, and, and educating yourself and their world, uh, that creates a common ground and, uh, and can oftentimes help in developing those relationships and maintaining those relationships. So, uh, hey, Chad, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you chiming in. Um, uh, so, so those are the kinds of things that we talk about uh, with genetic genealogy is it's a great, great, great tool. It only works if you have uh, DNA evidence of the suspect or the unknown remains uh, of the victim. And it's not, you know, a one size fits all solution to, to all unsolved cases. Um, uh, but again, call and make that, that connection with your law enforcement uh, agency. Um, if you follow our Facebook page, you're watching now, you know, we have lots of comments on, on our, uh, on our posts. Um, many of, of those are from family members that have, uh, questions or, or, or seeking answers. And, and we had one recently that, that said they had reached out to law enforcement, um, about genealogy, um, and there was a lack of funding. Uh, there's a lot of reasons a case 
can go cold. There's a lot of reasons why a case uh, will stay cold, but funding should never be one of them. There are options out there. There are uh, groups like Project Cold Case and others that can assist in funding for testing. Um, there are uh, um, grants available out there to law enforcement agencies, not to individuals, some of them not even available to uh, nonprofits like us, but that are available to law enforcement, uh, to the police uh the, the actual um, police force, either the police department or sheriff's office or the uh, state attorney's office, district attorney's office. Um, so funding should never, ever, ever be the reason you get uh, a response that they can't do, uh, do something. So um, if that is the response that you get, then I ask that you um, refer that the agency to us, refer the detective to us, uh, because um you know, sometimes people are just told, yeah, we don't have the funding for that, but that does not mean that there is not funding for that. Okay. So that's, that's the difference. But a lot of times uh, if somebody goes up the chain of command and says, Hey, uh, you know, I, I'd like to try this, uh, this new, new uh, technology for this case. And the agency says, yeah, well, we don't have any extra money, especially right now uh, with the COVID crisis and everything. Um, if they're saying they don't have the, the extra money, is different than not having the money. Uh, and also uh, them not having the money doesn't mean there isn't money uh, out there available. Uh, we know of some cases um, with the right uh, state labs that are, are um, you know free to the state uh, law enforcement agencies um, with the right type of, of extracts uh, that have been done within their own uh, state agency, uh, you know, for under a thousand dollars, you can get genetic genealogy, you know, off the ground and uh, and started just the lab portion, the testing portion. Um, and we have those contacts uh, that can help with that stuff. So um, so again, follow up on your loved ones cases. Make sure that that they have been brought up to the current investigative standards um, and and then follow up with that as technology changes and as, uh, you know, the um, uh, the case kind of the, the date of the last time your case was updated as that gets further and further away, because um, quite honestly, a lot of these technological changes and, and forensic science are under the radar. And the only people that really know about them are the people in the labs, the scientists and the law enforcement that that happens to uh, to call about a case and be told, oh, yeah, um, we can do this now. Or we can do that now. It used to be uh, if there was a mixture of DNA, then it was a mixture and there was nothing they can do. Now there's uh, applications that separate the mixture. Uh, it used to be that hair had to have a root. And if it had a root, it still was really, really difficult to get DNA. Now there's applications out there that can, um, you know, not always 100% effective, but that can get DNA uh, from a hair shaft. So, um, you know, that technology is always, in, you know, marching on, it's always advancing, and it's not always public knowledge. So uh, it really does come back to the victim's family to make sure that that they're following up on this stuff uh, and, 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 you know, confirming that, that cases are being brought up to investigative standards. And, you know, in some jurisdictions, that's a lot harder than in others. Uh, you know, if there's a, a, a rural jurisdiction out there with three cold cases, um, then they should be able to keep those cases up to investigative standards. If there's a jurisdiction out there with thousands of them, it's going to be obviously a lot harder. And uh, so one of the ways you kind of move yourself to the top of that list is staying engaged and in contact uh, with the agency. So in the, in, the, uh, in the post, in the title, I talked about, you know, Project Cold Case versus kind of true crime sites and podcasts. We get a lot of questions about um, true crime podcasts, a lot of families that want to do them, a lot of families that do them, uh, and then a lot of families that are upset after they've done them. Um, so we kind of wanted to, to hit on that a little bit. Uh, at present time, we do not uh, endorse any any true crime podcast. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good ones out there, and it doesn't mean that there aren't ones out there that could, could help your loved one's case. Um, but the problem is, is that that genre of podcasting is so, it's just, it's so expansive. 
um, that it's watered down. It's just there's too many true crime podcasts out there, and there's no way to know uh, if a new one is going to be good or helpful. There's too many people out there that are using uh, real crimes, real you know, um, uh, pain and trauma and, and tragedy and grief, um, and, and they're using that and sensationalizing that to try to make a name for themselves with very little concern for the victims or the victims' families. And, um, you know, we've had a, a couple of families recently reach out to us, uh, really upset that they had done podcasts of, of, on some, a smaller scale, podcasts that were just getting off the ground, podcasts that really had never dealt with unsolved murder and thought that it would be cool to talk about a cold case and, and have a family's perspective on there. And quite honestly, asked um, some some insensitive questions, uh, exposed some things that probably, you know, law enforcement wouldn't want out there publicly talked about that because it could jeopardize uh, the case and the future prosecution of the case. Um, so if you're going to do a podcast, uh, do one that has some kind of, um, uh, notoriety uh, that has been around for a little while, that has a history, that has um, sponsors, that has, you know, uh, a, a large number of listeners. And don't go in there cold. Don't go in there without having listened to anything they've ever done before. Uh, listen to their podcasts. Listen to um, the, the cases that they've talked about in the past and ask yourself if if what they bring um, is a value to your loved one's case, um, because the kind of the the coolness of being on a podcast wears off real fast, um, you know, when they say something offensive or inappropriate, or you know, uh, start victim blaming, or um, sometimes even worse, uh, they will they'll go down a rabbit hole of assumptions uh, that, that that really negatively impacts the the victim's family. And what I mean by that is um, you, you have to be sensitive about things. It's, it's really, really, really popular um, and commonplace for people to assume that if a case is not solved quickly, then there may have been some kind of cover up. And that makes for great podcasting and great uh, sensational news and headlines. And it grabs people's attention. Uh, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't help the case. Okay. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is unless you have some form of proof, um, then it's not particularly advisable to go around and accuse um, law enforcement agencies of, of covering up your loved one's murder uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, how does it benefit them? You know, and are they going to want to work with you moving forward if you've made these accusations? Two, if they have done something inappropriate uh, and, and something that um, warrants uh, an investigation by uh, a, a broader authority, the state police or, or federal uh, investigators, that stuff needs to be brought up, not publicly. Uh, it needs to be brought up appropriately so that those things can be dealt with appropriately. So um, so if you go running around and telling everybody that you know that there was a cover up and there was some impropriety, um, now you've given them the the opportunity to to try to cover it up more or, or patch it or do whatever they want to do, where the correct way to handle that would be to go up the chain of command uh, through their internal affairs department, through the state police, through the, the, the governor's office. Uh, you know, there, there are ways to, to approach that. And um, because let's be honest, if we've got uh, investigators out there that are covering things up, like, you know, that needs to be addressed and they need to be to be dealt with appropriately. Um, but what we have seen, unfortunately, is that more and more people just, it's the easy go-to. Uh, it's the easy, it's the easy connection. They didn't solve it because so-and-so was related to a judge. They didn't solve it because the suspect was um, a sheriff's son. Um, and they didn't solve it because we heard 
somebody did this, that, or the other. And, 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 you know, obviously that stuff, um, can be true. It has happened. Uh, it's a lot harder for that stuff to happen uh, these days, uh, just because all the people that would have to be in on it uh, to, to cover it up and the conspiracy and all the people whose careers could be ruined by covering up, um, you know, some poor investigator, you know, and I mean that poor as in a, a bad investigator, not as in a poor guy. Um, so, so keep that stuff in mind that if, if you're serious um, evidence of, of misconduct, there is an appropriate way. And we can certainly assist with, with who to contact um, if that's the case. But if it's just the easy thing to say, or you've heard rumors about this or that, um, I would do, do some real due diligence because you don't want to set a, you know, create a divide between you and the new investigator by talking about the old investigator and how everybody covered up for them, uh, if that's not true. Um, so in those podcasts, that's the stuff they love. You know, they want to hear about, um, you know, evidence tampering and, uh, you know, uh, relationships between uh, law enforcement and suspects, because that's the stuff that they think will get more listeners for their podcast. Um, and they could care less whether it's detrimental to your loved one's case uh, and a lot of and a lot of times um, again, because the the big picture here is if you are if there is any evidence of, of misconduct by an investigator, the big picture is here that needs to be dealt with appropriately, not the small picture of, you know, it gets on a podcast, you know, because that's really not going to um, to solve the problem. So. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a, a place for true crime, um, uh, podcasts, there's a place for true crime websites. Uh, there's a place for, you know, true crime, uh, uh, conventions and, and literature and, uh, you know, magazines. Um, but what we have found is that, that, where those things are is in generating interest about cases. So that's what your focus needs to be. If you're going to utilize true crime for your loved one's case is, is to, to raise awareness for it and have maybe a broader reach um, for it. But when it comes to helping victims, helping victims, families, um, you know, um, really, supporting them. That's what Project Cold Case does. That's the difference. True crime podcasts want to tell your story. Uh, they want to tell the, the gruesome details about, uh, uh, you know, horrific murder to get as many listeners as they can get. And then guess what? Next week, they're on to the next one, you know. Um, but what we do is is we try really hard to assist families um, that have have lost a loved one and, and to an unsolved murder and an unsolved homicide. And we do that in a number of different ways, which includes a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of um, uh, peer support, support meetings, uh, obviously assisting in raising awareness for cases, trying to get the local media involved, using social media, uh, setting up meetings with law enforcement, a lot of things that are quite honestly, behind the scenes that get more accomplished um, than just uh, um, trying to sensationalize something or talk about how gory or how gruesome uh, a, a murder is. Uh, you know, our buddy Derek chiming in, um, you know, he's, he's one of these guys that, that, that runs a site for the right reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's about getting the information out there and, and making sure that these families get justice. And, and it's real quick to, it's real easy to tell who's in it for that reason and who's in it just for themselves to create a name or sensation. And, um, and, the, and the way you do that is, is you follow them for a little while before you interact with them and you see what they've done, how long they've done it, how often do they go back and talk about a case that they brought up, you know, five years ago. Um, how often are they um, dealing with cases that are frustrating, that are um, that are devastating to the families, and how often are they talking about cases that aren't so sensational? You know, 
Um, it's real easy to get a bunch of followers and, and viewers and listeners uh, when you're talking about a serial killer or you're talking about, you know, children or, you know, or the more gruesome the killing. But uh, how often are they just out there trying to help the single victim um, that was sitting at the bus stop or or was even just, uh, you know, God forbid, in the wrong place at the wrong time? You know, are they focusing any of their energy on the masses of, of, of homicide victims or is it always trying to find one that will raise the bar and will be that much more sensational than the others? Um, you know, that's what, what we recommend you do is follow them for a little while, listen to their podcasts, follow their websites and see what they're in it for. You know, what, what is their interest? Are they making money off of that? Um, are they going to make money by, from sponsors, uh, by, by talking about your case? Um, how are they going to, to, you know, raise awareness for it and, and, and what is that reach going to be? And is it really going to, going to benefit you and your loved one? Um, so, you know, that's something that, that we really, really struggle with because we see how, how popular those podcasts are and we've considered, you know, how can we do it? What could we do that's different? It's such a saturated market. Um, you know, what could we do, uh, to be different? Um, and, and, and that's just not, you know, it's, it's, we can't find that line. We can't provide the services that we want to provide to families and put them and their loved one first and make a sensational podcast. You know, we have something very unique that a lot of podcasts don't have, and that's, um, experience with the families, their direct line of communication with families, every single one of them you see on our site, uh, and, um, and, you know, uh, we could bring that to the table, but we would, we have not been able to figure out a way to do that without what we feel like would be kind of violating a bond that we've created with those families. Uh, even if they were willing to, we just are not willing to put, um, the sensation ahead of the, the cause. Um, and we've got a, a somebody, uh, chiming in, uh, AK uh, says, I'm interested in submitting a cold case. It's only been eight months. So for us, it has to be a year. And the reason behind that is uh, you've got to be able, you got to give law enforcement a chance. Um, today's day and age, it is not uncommon for an arrest to happen a year, year and a half even later, in that case to never actually have been cold. Right. So um, so it, just because they haven't made the arrest doesn't mean it's not active uh, in, in a lot of jurisdictions. It's called, um, you know, suspending a case, administratively suspending it. Um, you know, they don't ever close a, a, a homicide without making an arrest or clearing it. But they sometimes have different terms, cold case, uh, suspended case. And when it reaches that status, that's really when we can step in and help. Uh, unfortunately, you know, um, we've got cases that are, you know, decades old uh, on our site. And so, uh, you know, one that's that's eight months old may very well still be uh, receiving evidence back from the, the state lab. Uh, people don't realize in a lot of jurisdictions that you can only submit so much evidence at a time to the lab for testing. So if you send your, what you think are your four best pieces of evidence to the lab and they get nothing back three months later, they send it back with nothing. Now you send it four more pieces of evidence and wait three months and then they send it back with nothing. And you can see how, you know, eight months could happen really, really quickly. Um, and they still be actively, um, uh, you know, pursuing it. I see uh, AK says, I just got in touch with the news and recently offered uh, up reward money. That is a great, great thing to do. Always uh, try to develop a relationship with your local media. Find a reporter that does a story on a cold case uh, that's been in your your area for a while, and um, and then try to develop that relationship with them because that's important stuff. And and you don't really want you know again, it's kind of like the uh, 
the podcasting thing, you don't want the reporter that just started that's trying to make a name for themselves and is hoping to move up to a bigger market or whatever. You want the reporter that's been in that city for a little while that has a vested interest in your community um, that is out there uh, volunteering their time with local charities that is uh, emceeing local uh, charity fundraisers, you know, find those reporters, investigative reporters that that go a little bit over, you know, a little bit extra, that extra mile on, on their stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, find those and start developing relationships. Reward, an increase in reward is a great way to, to develop interest with the media. Now, as it stands right now, I know our local stations that do uh, do cold cases with us. We had Lorena on last week and, and Katie from, from uh, First Coast News. Their stations have not been doing um, anything other than, you know, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 stories. Uh, and they have, you know, are just now starting to, to go back into pitching story ideas and getting these stories back out there. So, um, so, you know, kind of be aware of that, that, uh, they may not want to do that, that story right now, um, or they may not be able to do that story right now, uh, at, at eight months in, um, you know, they're probably going to look at say, Hey, you know, if we wait four months, then we can do a big story on the one year anniversary, the increased reward and, and they're pitching it, you know, to, to the, uh, higher ups in their, in their media, uh, world. And, and that's one of the things that kind of ends up generating some interest. So, um, but always uh, with the reward money, you know, don't increase it every other month, you know, just to get a story out there because potentially somebody out there with information is going to go, geez, they've already raised the reward twice in the last six months. I'm just going to hold out and see, you know, how long, um, how high this reward goes before I call in. So what you want to do is kind of reach up, uh, a, a notable number, you know. So if uh, if it's five thousand, if it's ten thousand, you know, um, you know, go in with a nice firm number and expect to leave it there for a little while. Also, contact your local Crime Stoppers because a lot of times they already have a thousand dollars, or in Florida they already have three thousand dollars for unsolved murders. And then what you can do is you can go in and you can say, "Hey, I want to increase." you know, my loved one's reward from 3,000 to 5,000 or from 1,000 to 10,000. And then you just, you know, write the check for the difference. Um, and that money is in a special account for your loved one. Um, you know, and, it, it, and then it falls under all the same rules as, you know, uh, anonymous calls, those kinds of things, because it can get tricky if Crime Stoppers has a reward and you have a reward and you can't guarantee anonymity and so they may not come to you or they come to Crime Stoppers because there's a $10,000 reward, but Crime Stoppers only has three and you've got the other 10 at home. And how do you know who called Crime Stoppers? Because that call was anonymous. So it gets very, very tricky when you start doing rewards on your own. I always recommend that you, you contact Crime Stoppers, uh, go in there with them. Uh, they've been doing rewards for a long time and they do a really good job at it. And a lot of times there's there's no point in uh and duplicating a service or reinventing the wheel. Um, let me see here. I want to. I want to read a comment. Uh, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, yeah. So Monica uh, tells a story here. A blogger that hated the sheriff picked up my son's case, and they were uh, going at it using my son's case as a weapon. I contacted the blogger and told him to completely stop reporting on my son's case. However, I was very disappointed that the story never made national news to help apply pressure to solve the case. So here's a situation. And Monica, thank you for, for, for providing us that, that insight, because a lot of us think that, that all publicity is good publicity and that how, you know, how could something bad happen from somebody, um, you know, raising awareness for your loved one's case. But, um, but gosh, that's, you know, they're using her son, you know, and they're not using her son for her benefit. Uh, they're using her son uh, in a feud with the sheriff. And, um, and, and, you know, Monica and her family have already been through enough. Uh, they don't need somebody out there, um, you know, creating a bigger divide because now does the sheriff believe that Monica set that up? 
Um, you know, or does he believe she had something to do with it, that the family had something to do with it? Uh, it's just a very, 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 very sticky situation. And, um, you know, so I, you know, encourage you guys to, uh, if you're dealing with this stuff, call our office because we'll sit there and, and have these conversations with you about the pros and cons of, you know, once it's said, it's said, you can't go back, you know, and, and it's out there, you know, online forever. So, um, you got to be very careful about, uh, you know, when you, when you, you know, fire that first shot across the bow, so to speak, and, and make sure that your, um, your affairs are in order, you know, because you, you, you want to have proof. Um, you know, Monica mentioned the, the, the national media and, uh, and it really, really is, uh, you know, the way to, to get the national media involved is really to have all of your evidence of, um, of some, some, you know, improprieties there and, and, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the law enforcement could have, should have done more. Uh, and if you have that proof, um, then it's a little easier to get them, uh, uh involved. Uh, Miss Jones chiming in and giving me some love. I appreciate that. Miss Jones. Um, Latasha, Maurice Samami still in the fight for justice. My heart is broken. My faith remains solid. You know, uh, that's that's two moms that have just that I've just read comments by. Uh, this past Sunday was uh, was Mother's Day. It did not go uh, unnoticed um, that there is a lot of of uh, sadness on on Mother's Day. There's a lot of moms that are missing children and a, and a lot of children that are missing moms. Um, and a lot of them that have been taken uh, violently by others in our communities. And um, so I want you all to know that uh, if you fall into those categories that we were thinking about you um, and that, you know, it, it was not forgotten that, uh, that a day of celebration and a day that's, you know, supposed to be of joy uh, was extremely difficult for a number of other families. Um, uh, let's see. I want to say Beth says my parents' case is almost nine years old and it's an old case, not a cold case. Um, so Beth, I don't know if you commented more. I don't, um, I don't really know if you're, if you're saying you don't like the term cold case, or if you're saying that law enforcement, um, considers it, uh, old and not cold. Um, you know, I'll say, uh, I'll say this, that, um, you know, at nine years, um, there's no reason that that a case would be active uh, nine years in unless um, some, you know, there was evidence that was being tested, that it was being relooked at. Um, there are people out there that don't like the term cold uh, when it refers to uh, unsolved cases. Um, you know, everybody has their opinion and that's fine. Uh, I, it never bothered me, uh, the, the terminology, the semantics of it. Um, uh, what I want to know is, is if a case is being, um, actively investigated or not. And the, uh, kind of, uh, pop culture term that has been adopted for cases that are not being actively investigated is cold case. And that's the, the, the terminology that, that most people know right off the, the bat, what you're talking about. Um, and so, uh, that's why we use it, um, if you prefer old or, uh, you know, whatever terminology people you prefer, um, you know, that's, uh, that's absolutely, you know, your, your prerogative and, and up to you. And, and, uh, I think that it's important that people that are struggling through this have a say, uh, in certain things. And so, you know, if you prefer when people talk to you about, uh, your, your parents case that they call it an old case versus a cold case, I think you're well within your, your, your rights uh, as a victim um, and as a survivor to express that. And hopefully uh, people will be respectful of that. Um, let's see. Star says, um, what happens when a law enforcement agency fails to get evidence camera footage before it's gone? Is there any kind of misconduct there or does it differ in jurisdiction? Um, you know, quite honestly, um, it, it, there's not any like, like law enforcement is protected uh, from from that being misconduct by, uh, you know, not picking up evidence that they should have or that somebody may feel like they should have um, it, just because it's so subjective. 
uh, they're protected from, you know, potentially, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, contaminating uh, evidence because they sneezed on something, you know what I mean, or coughed on something. So the misconduct thing would be like, did they purposely uh, not collect that evidence? Was there, um, uh, you know, malice involved? Did they see that there was a camera across the street, call the uh, the owner of that camera and say, hey, do you have video from last night? And the owner said, yes, I do. And then they said, okay, well, we'll get around to it. And the owner said, well, I, you know, this camera records over itself every 30 days. And then they didn't pick it up. That could be potentially uh, misconduct. Um, so the next kind of kind of question becomes, uh, if that evidence is gone, um, you know, then there's nothing that can be gained, uh, you know, from from it. Uh, so, <clears throat> so says, does that detective deserve to be, um, you know, deserve consequences for failing if there was misconduct? Absolutely, but. Um, but if you will, it will eat you up inside if you spend the rest of your life focused on that one video. OK, no case should be determined by one piece of evidence. Um, so uh, lots of cases don't have videos at all. So it's not like if they didn't have it, you know, that they can't create a case. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we'd all have uh, DNA, uh, nuns as eyewitnesses and uh, surveillance, high definition surveillance uh, of every crime uh, and a confession, you know, uh, but that's not reality. So, so, um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about, about that and when that's starting to get at you, that that's hurting you, you know, is, is that focus on that, that video. Um, so if, if they did something maliciously, then yes, it should be brought up through the internal affairs department. If you go through internal affairs and they determine that, the detective didn't know that that video existed until after um, it had already been recorded over or uh, or was destroyed. Um, then there's not going to be any kind of um, you know formal consequences for that detective because he didn't know. So it it really you know it, it depends. I mean, not just jurisdictionally, but the situation. You know, did um, you know did a, a detective uh, with no gloves on reach down and pick up? Uh, a cigarette butt with the suspect's DNA on it, you know, rub it in his hands and throw it over his shoulder laughing as he walked uh, off the crime scene. You know, that that's, um, you know, that's misconduct that can be punished. You know, um, if, if somebody does something, you know, inadvertently, uh, they're not going to be punished for it. And, and again, remember that, that not one thing should, you know, if they, if all they had was the, was the video, um, then the defense attorney would spend the entire trial trying to get that video suppressed so that it couldn't be seen and use every you know trick in the book um, and every defense in the book to say that that wasn't his client and you know whatever. So uh, so you don't want to hang your hat on um, on one piece of evidence. And again, if it has been, if it was done maliciously, then follow through on it. If it was not done maliciously, then uh, uh, what I always like to do is. <clears throat> where do we go from here? Like, so this is where we are now. You screwed up. You, uh, you, you missed evidence. Um, there's nothing that anybody can do about it. I'm not happy about it. Uh, I feel like you should do better. Uh, I feel like the investigators here should do better, but, um, but now moving forward, what can you do, um, to, to, uh, to solve this case now that we don't have this, you know, and, uh, and it is okay for you to, to show your frustration, to express your frustration. I would always encourage you to do it in a, in a still respectful and responsible way. Uh, but you have every right in your loved one's case to tell somebody that they, um, that they messed something up if they messed it up. Uh, now, whether they own it and admit to it and apologize for it and try to move forward you know, or whether they, you know, um, steadfast and, you know, and not taking responsibility. Those are all other things that you're going to have to have to deal with. And that's why it is so specific. So, um, you know, again, feel free to, to, to call uh, our office and we can talk more specifically about it. Um, Latasha says it's been 1202 days since her only son, Maurice Hobbs, was murdered and still no arrests. Uh, she will never stop fighting for justice. 
um, just as for Maurice, you know, uh, absolutely. You know, we don't expect any of these, any of our families to, um, uh, to, to stop fighting for it. You know, if you stop fighting for it, um, then, then, you know, not only are you, is your, your son losing that voice, is your loved one losing that voice uh, publicly, but someone else's loved one is going to potentially be hurt because, um, because this person gets away with it and they goes on, they go on and do it again. Um, so never give up that fight. Monica said that crime watch daily with Chris Hansen picked it up, but then the show was canceled. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we did some work with, with them on a, on a couple of cases, um, when Kim Goldman was, was, was working with them. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Kim, obviously, you know, her, her brother was murdered at the same time. Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered. Um, and so she's been an advocate ever since. And, and, uh, so she was really, really, you know, doing her part to make sure that families were not, um, you know, uh, violated in any way, uh, um, you know, with that show. And then of course it gets canceled, but maybe Monica knowing that, um, uh, that crime watch daily was interested in it. You know, that might be a push that would interest other, uh, national, um, you know, crime shows that they might be interested in taking that on. Um, you know, so we've had, um, we have not had great luck with, uh, working with, um, you know, production companies and, uh, and television shows. Um, we had a, a really, really, really bad, um, experience with one um that completely lied to the family lied to us about what they were going to do uh manipulated the timeline um changed facts to to sensationalize it and to make it uh, a better show to watch um uh we had another uh a documentary that uh that promised things to the family that they still have not come through for um you know so so we haven't had the best luck with these shows um, but that doesn't mean that they're not some good ones out there. Uh, Cold Justice has done a couple of, of shows with families that, that we uh, have helped and they've done a great job. Uh, we've had, uh, in fact, recently I've had contact with uh, Kelly Sigler from that show, um, you know, and, and, and expressed uh, appreciation for the families that, that she's helped with. Um, so uh, be, just be cautious, Monica, in, in the cases that you select or the, the agencies or production companies or shows that you select, um, you know, and go into it knowing that, uh, that, you know, you, you, they may say or do something to try to get viewers that is not true. And they're really unapologetic about it. It's really pretty infuriating, but, um, uh, Beth did chime back in and said law enforcement considers it old. They are still investigating. So that's a, um, uh, <laughs> Beth, you should call our office. Uh, that is a, as a, as a, you know, maybe, and I hope they are, I hope that there is something there nine years later that they are working on. Uh, if they have been working on that case continuously for nine years, uh, there's a problem there. And most likely what the problem is, is that uh, there's public records laws out there. And if they say that the case is closed or they say the case is suspended, uh, then you uh, legally may have access to that case file and the ability through uh, the Freedom of Information Act to request those records. And the way that they circumvent that is to say that it's an active investigation. Um, and something that pisses me off is when uh, somebody lies and says something is being investigated for the sole purpose of keeping information from the family, and it's not actually being uh, being uh, investigated. So, and uh, and oh my good buddy Daryl Price just chimed in. Uh, Daryl is a is an amazing amazing individual um, that. Uh, uh, has done more for cold cases uh, in, in, in our country than, than any of us could ever hope to do. And Daryl, I appreciate you uh, chiming in today. Uh, Daryl has taught me a, a million things, um, if he's taught me one. And, um, and he's one of those people that I, I refer to. When, when I talk about uh, stuff, I, I try to have 
every perspective and every opinion from from every angle that I can. And I don't uh, I don't go to other people and say, you know, uh, tell me about something you don't know about. I go to the source. And, uh, and Daryl is, uh, is one of those people that, that is the source. Uh, and he's done more. You know, if, if uh, I don't want to give away too much, Daryl, because I don't want people <laughs> bothering you. But uh, just just know that uh, your words mean a lot and that I appreciate all you have done for so many. And, uh, and, and you have always been the been one of those that keep it honest and keep it true. Uh, and, and when you're a family and you're dealing with this kind of stuff, uh, you don't need the sugar coating. You've already gone through the worst day of your life. OK, so so telling me that that you're not, that an arrest isn't imminent is not going to, you know, is not going to be the worst thing I've ever heard. You know, uh, that was the day they came and told me that my loved one was murdered. So, um, so I can handle that kind of stuff. Uh, what I can't handle is uh, telling me stuff that's not true. You know what I mean? So, um, oh man, look at some of these, um, some of these people, Ashley Wellman is chiming in too. Um Ashley, thank you. I mean, your words also mean so much. Uh, Ashley, Ashley is a professor uh, out at TCU, uh, teaches criminal justice, criminology, victimology, uh, does so much for uh, for victims. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that's really lacking out there is information about uh, these, these victims and their families and how the long term impacts of, of this kind of victimization. It's it's different. Uh, there's layers of complexity. We've talked about it in past Facebook lives. But, uh, um, you know, when you lose a loved one to a homicide, that's different than losing a loved one to old age. Uh, depending on the circumstances and what was done to that to that victim can add layers of complexity. Uh, law enforcement not being able to make an arrest adds a layer of complexity. Uh, uh, law enforcement that isn't forthright and uh, with you uh, adds a layer of complexity. Uh, so, you know, when we when we talk about this stuff, you know, it's hard to generalize all of these cases and all of these victims and all these survivors. Um, but we, we do the best we can, knowing that uh, each one specifically is different. And uh, and so uh, Ashley does great work. I had I had plans this year. I was going to Texas. We had. Um, we had great contact with a, a detective at the Dallas Police Department, um, and, and Ashley was teaching at, at TCU not far away, and, uh, and there was a couple other, uh, a Texas Ranger that I know, and there, were, there was a handful of things that one trip to Texas, I was going to be able to, to, to connect with a lot of really good people, and, uh, and, and so um, that was on the agenda this year. I had hoped to have already done it by now, but obviously... Uh, COVID stopped that. And uh, so I haven't been able to do that, but uh, that's still on, on my mind and on my list is, is to get out there to Texas and meet with these people that are doing some great things for cold cases and victims. Um, let's see. Um, Paley was, uh, I don't, I don't, Patricia, I don't know the answer to uh, if they are still investigating that that case. Um, we haven't had contact with the investigators on that one uh, in a while, so I don't know um, what their status is. You know, we because we have so many families and so many victims, we really rely on the families to keep us in the loop as well. Um, and we we try to. Uh, coordinate with the families. All right. Uh, are you going to reach out or are we going to reach out? Because there should only be one of us reaching out. The investigators are going to get annoyed if you're reaching out and I'm reaching out and, and somebody else is reaching out. So let's pick a point of contact and let's let that, that be um, who gets the information and then disseminates it between everybody else. Um, and, and quite honestly, it just, we can't, uh, um, you know, we would spend all day on the phone going through every victim asking for an update. And by the time we got to the end of our list, we'd have to start back over again. Just that's how, how many it is. So we really have to kind of work in a, um, uh, you know, concerted effort together. So I'm seeing some comments that are, uh, uh, Latasha says, um, I use the term climate control. I bring the heat when I know it's time. Our investigation is still active. Uh, keeping the pressure applied in the fight for justice. And then I saw somebody else on here, what type of heat 
and how do you know when it's time? Uh, that that's a good question, uh, Julie. Um, you know, uh, so after 31 years, I asked to see the evidence files. Of course, they wouldn't let me. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about, uh, uh, Julie. Like, so, so why not? Like, what, that's the question. And, and it can't be general, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you why not. Uh, but, um, but, you know, in a point like that, um, if there is legitimate reason why they're keeping it from you, and, and I'm going to tell you what you might consider, uh, what they might consider a legitimate reason. If you are on social media and you're blasting them for being horrible investigators, horrible detectives, horrible human beings, um, you know, if you're pointing out every flaw, every, you know, everything they've ever done wrong in 31 years and applying that to the detectives that are there today, because those are obviously not the same detectives that were there when that crime happened, um, then uh, they're going to use every trick in the book to keep uh, you from having information partially because they don't want you running around telling what they do have um, to the world. Um, and there's some, some necessity to that. They, they really is, unfortunately, some necessity to keep that information uh, close to the vest. So, um, uh, but if you guys have been, you know, the model survivors and, and you've never um, publicly, you know, chastised them or, or crucified them, you know, or anything like that. And, and, uh, and, and they just won't do the courtesy of sitting down with you to, to explain and show you things, then that's different, you know, and that's, that's, um, that's something that, that we should, you know, consider and, and, and we could maybe talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with. Um, I think, you know, Latasha uh, commented, um, she cannot solely rely on the detectives to serve my son justice uh, as mother, it's also her job. She's out in the community passing out flyers and advocating for my son on a legislative level. Um, I have to keep the awareness uh, for justice going. Um, you know, absolutely. And, you know, uh, and, you know, these detectives, and I know uh, that case, uh, Maurice Hobbs, uh, here in, in Jacksonville, you know, um, you know, even if they are active, you know, that case is active, which you said it was, um, how many cases have they picked up that team, that homicide team, how many have they picked up since Maurice's murder, you know? So, so now they're juggling the, the newer ones, the older ones, the follow-ups, you know, and all that stuff. And, and that's not always the case. Again, that's uh, how violent, you know, the place you live is. We live in Jacksonville and unfortunately we deal with a lot of violence. Um, and, and so, uh, that's a again an added layer of complexity, um, but I think you know to to Latasha's point <clears throat> about putting pressure on. I, I've been in the uh, uh, in her presence when uh, people that tell her certain things privately, uh, and then they go publicly and they say something else, or they say something uh, publicly that is not what they've said privately. And, uh, and, and Latasha holds them accountable. And I think, you know, in, in my world, uh, Latasha is a little more vocal than, than I am uh, about that stuff. And I think there is a time and a place for that. But I think the key factor there is accountability. And the one thing you have to have to do is hold people accountable. And we're, we're trying to hold accountable the people that killed our loved ones. Uh, and, and we have a responsibility to hold accountable the ones that are investigating uh our loved ones murder. And so, but, but there's degrees of that. And, and one of the things that is important to remember is that uh, what we talked about earlier was, you know, have they done something um, uh, egregious? Have they done something malicious to, um, to hold back the investigation? Uh, Cause that's, that's a different kind of accountability than, they've gotten busy and it kind of got pushed to the side. Right. So, um, cause that happens, you know? And so what we do we hold them accountable is we keep in touch with them and we remind them that we're still out there waiting and that we're still out there making, uh, you know, doing our part. Uh, what Latasha does is, is important because, um, cause no one else is going to do it. Nobody else is out there passing out flyers about Maurice Hobbs. Right. So, um, so she takes that responsibility and she does it, uh, on her own, um, so uh, people will know Maurice's name, 
Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean that that's what every family should do. Um, uh, some families, uh, I'm sure, are, are not uh, interested in going out and talking publicly. We know some of those families. Um, that's okay, too. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't have to be the vocal one. Um, and in fact, we, we really do recommend that, that, that you just, uh, you know, maintain that relationship privately. You know what I mean? And, and then what that does is, is it allows you to then, if you need to, go public with that stuff. Okay. But we always would recommend that you, you work behind the scenes to, um, you know, to, to create and, and maintain those relationships. Uh, and if something should go south and you need to go public, uh, it's a lot easier to say, look, and people will listen more when you say, this is what I have done for this long. I have done this, 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 and this, and everything that they've asked me to do. Um, and now I'm at this crossroads and I need the, the community support and help. Um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, Latasha says it's uh, an open investigation, releasing any evidence, potentially jeopardize the integrity of the case. Um, uh, yeah. And she says, you know, look, I can, show this on on the screen there um uh i can't tell you anything mom i i have to keep maurice tight to uh, in my best yeah and and you know i man it, it drives me crazy that they can't tell people um and i believe that if you develop a a relationship with that detective from the beginning that is respectful you have a lot better chance down the road when it becomes a year and a half two years five years, 10 years for them to give you information. Um, what I have experienced is that when you uh, rush out and automatically um, start uh, throwing flames and throwing rocks, uh, that then they just get tighter and tighter with that information. But the problem is, is that, and I have seen it with my own two eyes, is that they will say, I'm going to give you this information. Please do not tell anyone outside of the immediate family that needs to know. And then an hour later, it's on the news. And I've seen it happen. And I've been in the meetings where detectives say, please do not release this information. And then the family releases the information, you know, and then all that does is it, it, it punishes the rest of us um, who, you know, are hoping and hoping and hoping to get that little bit of information. And, uh, and it is really hard to come back from that. Once you have, once you have violated that trust with the detective, it's really hard to, to, to build that back up if you can, um, ever, you know, um, let's see. Is there anything done with law enforcement agency gives a lackluster investigation because the victim happened to use drugs? Um, you know, we hear this, a lot uh that um my loved one uh you know was buying drugs was selling drugs had drugs in their system uh my loved one was homeless my loved one was an addict my loved one uh, had mental health issues my loved one um you know uh, sold her body sold their body um to make ends meet and I don't believe that the investigation was thorough or that they considered my loved one a true victim. And, uh, and so, um, you know, again, this is something that is very specific to the investigation in the case. Um, I have seen a lot of detectives uh, put forth a lot of a tremendous amount of effort on drug cases, on uh, prostitution cases, on homeless cases, on unidentified remains cases. Uh, I mean, I have seen, so it's, it's not fair to lump, you know, uh, everybody in on that. But I have also heard detectives uh, use that term, a true victim. You know, what is a true victim? Um, and, and I definitely don't uh, agree with that. I don't believe there should be a... Uh, a hierarchy or a priority list of, of victims. Um, if that is the case, uh, there is a, is a very simple solution star, but, uh, but it's a very complicated matter. So the, the, the simple solution is, is you go up the chain of command, but the complicated part is that you better have proof. 
you know, because that's everybody's go to is you didn't do it because my loved one bought drugs. You didn't do it because my loved one was a felon. You didn't do it because my loved one uh, was out at a club at, at night. Look, none of those are excuses for your loved one being murdered. None of them. Drugs, prostitution, uh, prior convictions. None of that is justification for your loved one being murdered. But as when it as often as it's true, it's used when it's not true. And that's where that that issue comes in. It's kind of similar to what we talked about with the, with the uh, podcast earlier, you know, is if you're going to allege a cover up, allege misconduct or that have the evidence and have the proof, because if you have that proof and you go to the chain of command and when I say chain of command, if it's a detective, you go to their sergeant. Uh, if it's a sergeant, you go to the lieutenant. If it's a lieutenant, you go to their chief. All, you know, you go up and, um, and you bring that evidence and you say, uh, the detective told me that, well, your loved one was, was buying drugs. You know, what do you want me to do? That's proof. You know what I mean? And, and so that's what I would say, Star, is, um, you know, uh, being able to prove that an investigation is lackluster is really, really hard. Uh, we all have opinions. We all can make assumptions. Uh, unfortunately, because like we're talking about how tight to the chest a lot of the information is, we are making those determinations without all the information. So a lot of times I've seen families, they go in and they're very accusatory and they're like, you didn't even talk to so-and-so. And then the detective flips through the page and goes, I, we brought them in on this date, on this time we talked to them. Uh, they didn't provide us the information that you say they have. And what happened is that person was willing to talk to somebody in the neighborhood, but they were not willing to talk to police. And when the time police got to them, their story had changed from I saw everything to I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so it's not that the investigation was was bad. It's that, you know, the community's help wasn't good. You know, there's, there's just a lot of different scenarios like that that need to be uh, that have to be taken into account. And again, um, you know, are specific to uh, to to the case that you're talking about. Um, uh, <clears throat> Amy says, make sure to get the report. Tell and start to make sure she gets the report because she thought the same thing. Her cousin's disappearance and was surprised at the work the detectives had done. Uh, Amy, thanks for for uh, sharing that. And, and start kind of as we talked about. You don't know if they're going to be willing to sit down and give you that information and show you what they've done. But we had a family uh, in a case. They were they wouldn't even live here anymore. Their mom disappeared from here. They were four hours away on vacation and asked if they could come over and meet with our office. And we asked, do you want to meet with the detective? Cause we have a pretty good relationship with that agency. We facilitated a meeting uh, that the, the, they came to me and they said, you know, so the, the story we've always heard is that there's a manila envelope with one piece of paper in it. And that's our mom's uh, case file. And uh, you know, it's like, oh, that's horrible. You know, where did you hear that? Well, it couldn't remember just been passed down through, you know, conversations. Um, so we went to meet with the detective and the detective sat down with a three inch three ring binder, set it down. And they said, well, what's that? And they said, well, this is the case file. This is uh, your mom's case. And they're like, wait a minute. We were always told there was just one sheet of paper. And uh, the detective said, um, no, 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 this is this is the, you know, um, this is the case file. And, um, and it was similar, um, you know, to what Amy just brought up was that, uh, and we had another case where a family was like, we just don't feel like they've done a very thorough investigation. And uh, a new uh, cold case detective took over in that jurisdiction. I happened to know him. I went out and met with him. Uh, he, he says, well, let me show you, you know, we only have a handful of uh, cold cases, but I'll show you our vault where we keep all the, the case files. And he opens it up and there was eight bankers boxes with this victim's last name on them. And I said, that's the, you know, that case. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, and the family doesn't believe, you know, they believe that it was a, wasn't a very thorough investigation. And he said, well, you know, I, I've just started here. I'm happy to meet with them and talk to them. He said, I haven't gone through all eight of those bankers boxes yet. I'm, I'm just settling in, but I can tell you work has been done on that case. Uh, he said, you know, so, so sometimes it's a it's a matter of perception and, and assumptions because we're not being given that information, you know, and if we don't have it, if we don't have somebody telling us, hey, look, we just opened up another banker's box of, of information, um, then sometimes we can feel like, well, they're obviously not doing anything on it. 
Um, Rebecca says she's very close with the lead detective on her son's case. And she has told me things, evidence why she probably shouldn't have. Uh, but it was definitely um, things that I needed to hear, especially now that this case is inactive. It was important for me to build that trusting relationship with her. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. That was uh, um, that was something that I, I, I chimed in with. Uh, I, I was able to develop a really good relationship with the, the detective on my dad's case. And he absolutely told me things that he shouldn't have. He also, at the very beginning, didn't tell me things that he probably should have. Uh, but he didn't. And then I went uh, and told the media that uh, something had happened that didn't happen. And he called me up and he said, where'd you get that information? And I said, well, it just made sense to me. It just uh, was the logic that I came up with. And he said, yeah, we need to meet because uh, that did not happen. Um, so, you know, that was kind of my first lesson in, you know, what our brain does. And it's a natural thing. Like, don't beat yourself up because you start creating a scenario in your head. Um, that's what we all do. And especially when we're not getting information, you know what I mean? So, um, uh, Rebecca says she would never share what the detective uh, told her to jeopardize the case. And that that's important, you know, and it's hard sometimes. And the longer that case is inactive and the longer it's, you know, uh, there's no resolution, the more you want to come out, you know, with some of that information. And, and quite honestly, in some cases, the longer that that case is cold, the more appropriate it is to come up with that, come out with that, you know, maybe not in, uh, in Rebecca's son's case, Jonah Golden, but uh, because it's, it's the, you know, the number of years it's been, but, but we've had cases that were from the seventies and let's be honest, most of the people involved in those cold cases are either dead. They don't remember, they can't be found. Um, so what does it matter if you release you know, one little bit of information that typically, you know, you would have kept close to the vest in 1974. Uh, but now it could be the difference in, in what somebody's, you know, drunk uncle said at the Thanksgiving dinner table one night, you know. So um, so I think like, again, each case is specific. But in my opinion, and I've talked to a number of law enforcement officers that disagree with this. But in my opinion, at a certain point, there should be information that they're more willing to uh, to release at a certain time. You know, 10 years later, um, you know, maybe something that was super important back then uh, was not important now. Uh, and I can use my dad's case on this. Uh, they had a, my dad left the, you know, called 911 and gave a, you know, a very generic and brief description of the man that had just shot him. Uh, uh, that description literally is worthless now, 10 years later, because... Um, because who remembers what somebody looked like that you didn't know and what they were wearing 10 years ago, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, but they chose not to release that description at the time, uh, because it was all they had and, uh, they needed to be able to prove if anybody called, called in and said, Hey, I think so-and-so was involved in that murder the other day. Uh, the only bit of evidence that they had to, to corroborate that was what my dad said on that 911 tape. And, uh, and so if they released that information and somebody called up and said, it was so-and-so, uh, he looks like this and he was wearing that, um, there's no way for them to know for sure if they got that information firsthand or, you know, from the, the, um, the release. So this stuff is complicated, folks. I, I appreciate you sticking with me. This was not supposed to be a, an hour plus long uh, Facebook Live, but when you start asking uh, questions, good questions and, and uh, questions that could help uh, other families, uh, then I'm going to stick around and try to answer them. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, and I know I'm a little behind. You guys have been commenting as I've been talking. And, and so it's a little behind, you know, but I, I appreciate your engagement. I really do. Um, you know, Latasha seconding our comment that, uh, you know, unfortunate choices doesn't mean anyone deserves to be murdered, period. Um, you know, I, I tell families this, you know, because they do, they feel down, they feel somewhat responsible. They feel like people don't care because their loved one bought some weed, you know, and it just, it's ridiculous to think that, um, that that justified a murder or in any way makes their life less valuable. It just, it drives me crazy. But, um, but that's the feeling that we get. Like, you know, what, what did my dad do? What did my son do? Who was he with? Where was it? You know, and, and you, you know, 
rational or irrational, you know, thoughts and fears, they're yours and, you know, and you have to deal with them. And so, um, you know, again, I've said it, you know, you, you don't justify a murder because somebody did something wrong. And quite honestly, another difference between Project Cold Case and True Crime Podcast is that um, Project Cold Case will tell you that, that like, you know, we, we don't care. Uh, that your loved one was selling drugs or buying drugs. We don't care that your loved one was a prostitute. Uh, we don't care that your loved one was homeless and had addicted addiction issues. Um, you know, uh, that's not what matters. We're here for you. We're here for the people that are left behind. And, you know, if you can possibly, you know, justify that, that somebody was doing something, you know, that, that uh, they shouldn't have been doing that may have contributed uh, to their murder, uh, why would you punish their their mother or you know their father or their siblings or their children um, who obviously if they had their choice they wouldn't want them to have made that decision you know and so uh, to turn your back on the family that's left behind because um, the victim made a choice and did something that maybe you wouldn't do uh, is is inappropriate and sad. Um, uh, Tammy Downs, uh, you know, no matter how hard it is, we need our detectives, uh, even though our case was not done right, we need them uh, and keeping the voice for our loved one. That's a, it's a great comment, Tammy. I'm going to put it up there for a second because um, we have another case that's not Tammy's that's, uh, uh, and Tammy's is a, is, a, is a, you know, probably right up there at the top of the list of, of cases that were mishandled uh, at the time. Uh, but but this other case that was handled inappropriately here locally, uh, uh, and we met with the law enforcement, and and I remember I was shocked. They they sat down with the family and they said, you know, right out of the gate, we're going to tell you that you know, in 1981, in our area, we did not have many murders. Uh, we did not uh, do a great good job investigating this. A lot of mistakes were made, and and those mistakes have have hampered us uh, moving forward. Um, and uh, and so, you know, um, but when they're honest with you and they say that now we can we can address that issue. You're right. You did screw up. You did mess up. You acknowledged it. You have uh, you, you know, you have um, you have validated my feelings. Um, of, of loss and of hurt and, you know, of abandonment by the, the individuals that are supposed to be helping me uh, get some resolution. And, um, and then we can start to build and move forward. Right. So we talked about it, like, let's, let's address those things. Let's talk about them. Let's share our feelings about them. And then let's, uh, let's build from them and move forward. Cause again, these were not the same detectives and they were willing to admit the, the mess ups that happened. Um, but, it wasn't going to do them any good to point the fingers at those people from back then and blame them and just say, well, we can't do anything. They screwed up. Uh, their goal was to, what can we do now? What can we do moving forward? Um, so thank you, Tammy, for that. Um, uh, Star says she has seen that file and that they didn't investigate anything. So, um, you know, uh, it's hard for us to talk about, you know, something that we haven't seen or talked with, you know, let's, uh, let's chat about that though. Uh, uh, call our office this week. We posted the number on there. Uh, let's talk about ways that we can address that and see, um, you know, uh, if there was, um, again, egregious and malicious misconduct there, um, uh, or what the, the scenario was, um, uh, yeah, Amy again says, you know, reach out to them and we can help with that, you know, star. So, you know, we can do that. Uh, Tasha, appreciate Project Cold Case help with guidance, you know. Um, yeah, well, Latasha, we, you know, we wish that no one had to provide this kind of guidance, right? But um, unfortunately, there's so many of us um, that are there. And uh, Latasha and Rebecca, you guys are both... Uh, uh, local families that have experienced something tragic with your sons. Uh, and, and I can't remember exactly the dates, but not far from each other, you know, um, uh, and both of you have done amazing jobs on uh, making sure that, that uh, your sons uh, were not forgotten, that, that uh, nobody just 
um, pushes them aside and forgets that that they were uh, members of our community and that they were stolen from us and taken from us. And uh, so um, keep doing what you're doing and, and keep reaching out to us and we will help however we can. Um, and one of our favorites, uh, Tamika, um, you know, who had chimed in that she knows that feeling. And, uh, you know, again, uh, we have a number of, of, uh, of families that, um, you know, Tamika, I don't think I'm stepping out of line here. You know, we have the conversations that we have had in our office privately um, with Tamika, with Tammy, with Sandra Jones, you know, uh, with so many of these people that are commenting, um, you know, honestly, that is the type of stuff that podcasts would love to get their hands on and, and talk about and, and run wild with. Uh, but what that would do would it would it would jeopardize that trust and that bond that we have built with these families and with some law enforcement agencies. Uh, and we're just not willing to to jeopardize um, that trust uh, for some uh, you know, for a few minutes of fame, you know, um, uh, Tamika and, and I have sat through, uh, conversations that no one should have to sit through with detectives. Uh, there are things about Tamika's mom's case that, um, you know, just are, are like all cases are heartbreaking, but, uh, when you start to get into the details and you start to know some of the, some of the facts, um, it's, it's, it's devastating and it's hard. And, uh, you know, I, I wish we could do more, uh, for, for Tamika and all our families, but we will continue to do everything that we can for each of you. And that means that, you know, if you've submitted your, your loved one to, to our, uh, our organization, that if an opportunity presents itself with a podcast, with a TV show, uh, with a local news station, um, your loved one is on that list and we go through them and we try to cycle through them uh, and, and create, keep a, a diverse group and keep, whether it's uh, race, gender, uh, time since the murder, all of those things come into consideration, uh, you know, when we're, we're looking at cases so that we're not just repeatedly showing the same, you know, uh, images over and over again. Uh, it's a, it's a, complicated and sometimes frustrating um, process. Uh, uh, Amy asked if we assist with missing persons as well. And, uh, and Amy, only uh, if it's presumed foul play uh, with the family and law enforcement. Uh, sometimes law enforcement is a little bit hesitant to admit that they suspect foul play. Uh, but even more importantly to us is as the family, every image on our, on our site is somebody that has been uh, the victim of a homicide. And what I, I would never be able to live with myself if a, a mother somewhere out there was Googling her, you know, child's name and our site pulled up and, and there among the murdered is, uh, is her son or daughter who she believes is coming home one day. And then I, you know, we've re-victimized her by, uh, by putting that uh, on our site. Um, there are a lot of, of missing persons sites out there and, um, and resources, a lot of them that do a lot of good stuff. Uh, Q Center for the Missing, I think the AWARE Foundation or something like that, the Charlie Project, NamUs, National Center for the Missing Exploited Children. Um, you know, they are focused on those missing. Um, and so we always refer missing families to those if there is hope that, that, that their loved one is still alive. Uh, if it is believed that their loved one um, is not alive and that foul play was uh, was a part of their disappearance, then yes, we will um, we will add them to our site and and do what we do, um, you know, for awareness. So, uh, but again, that's basically because um, you know we started out homicide. We want to help everybody, but we've kind of learned that our plate is so full with homicides that we're doing a disservice. Um, to, you know, the, the missings that are, 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 uh, are still out there, um, you know, and, and we don't want to dilute the services that are provided. Um, if your cousin was definitely murdered, then yes, that is something that, um, that we would add to our site. So um, we have been going for almost an hour and a half. And, uh, and I am, am thrilled at the uh, engagement that we had tonight uh, and the number of survivor families 
uh, that chimed in and talked to us. Uh, I saw a number of, of people that I'm friends with um, that did not comment, uh, but that were um, that chimed in and, and were watching with us, at least for um, some short period of time, that are, um, are great human beings. Uh, um, a lot of them survivors, um, former advocates, uh, current advocates for other uh, groups and organizations. Um, and I, I really do. I think, you know, the topic probably caught a few people, you know, Project Cold Case True Crime podcast. Uh, you know, we wanted to be able to share what we do and why it's different and, uh, and but why it's important. And so that was the long way of saying when we're talking to families that have experienced that, that's what we want to do. I, you know, I want to raise awareness for these cases. We want to raise awareness for these cases, but we are not doing it to make a name for ourselves or for our organization. Um, uh, I, I don't, I want to reach people that haven't been impacted because I want them to understand how important it is to care about uh, unsolved homicides in our country. Um, but at the end of the day, my number one priority and Project Cold Case's number one priority will always be uh, the victims and their families. And, um, and so to be able to engage with you guys tonight and, and answer questions and go back and forth and know that so many of these comments are from survivors um, that trust us with their loved one's case, uh, it means a lot to us. And that in, in itself is the difference between Project Cold Case and, and other true crime sites. So uh, if you're a true crime fan and you come to our site and you watch this stuff and you learn something and you share these stories, that is great and that is amazing. Just always know that our priorities are going to lie with the families, and uh, and that's who we're going to turn to first. Um, so, with that said, Amy, you're welcome. Uh, ProjectColdCase.org. Go to the contact tab uh, on the far right, and there's a submission link underneath that contact form on our website, and you can submit your cousin's case or have a family member uh, submit your uh, cousin's case. Um, uh, Area code 904-525-8080. If we talked about anything today that you want to get a little more specific with uh, in regards to your loved one's case, call our, our office. Uh, you will most likely get in touch with Frida, uh, our victim advocate, who uh, does an amazing job. Um, and we will uh, collaborate and work together and, uh, and we'll have conversations with you to help however we can and to get as much information as possible. So uh, thank you all so much again for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week. I'll try to have a guest on next week if I get a little downtime and can, and can line somebody up uh, and maybe talk about something specific. But uh, uh, thank you again so much. Uh, I really appreciate um, your uh, participation tonight. And uh, we will see you next week.